Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Green Chef. Feel like the star of your own cooking show with the Green Chef Meal Kits. Green Chef is a meal kit company that delivers everything you need to cook gourmet meals at home, including organic ingredients and easy recipes. Plus, they are USDA certified organic, and they offer options for specialty diets like vegan, paleo, gluten-free, and more. Sign up today for a special limited-time offer. Go to greenchef.us slash watch for $50 off your first meal kit. That's greenchef.us slash W-A-T-C-H for $50 off. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is your hub for teamwork in Office 365. With so much to look after, wouldn't it be great if there was just one place to look? Teams is that single workspace where you can work, share, and connect with the people in your work life. Teams brings together your chats, meetings, files, and apps all in one place. Take teamwork where you work with apps for mobile and desktop. So whether you're sprinting towards a deadline or sharing your next big idea, Teams can help you and your team achieve even more. Microsoft Teams and Office 365. Visit office.com slash teams to learn more. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio podcaster sees ghost it's andy greenwald it's an exciting time to be a culture podcaster i guess it is andy breaking news before we get to the breaking news i just want to tell you a couple things about the ringer.com and our and our various arms of media yeah and what we've got going on first of all watch the andre doc if you haven't already on hbo it's on demand great documentary if you get some time today, catch up on all the things you need to know about Westworld. I highly suggest checking out Alyssa Bearsnack's Westworld syllabus mm. on the ringer.com. And if I may be so bold as to suggest two podcasts that feature the same person in my life, Amanda Dobbins. Wow. One of the best out. The queen. And she is the co-host of Jam Session with mm. my office roomie, Juliette Littman. And they had a great episode this week about the Tristan Thompson, Khloe Kardashian Fiasco. Contratomp. Shall I say. And then Amanda also hosts Recapables Atlanta. So Recapables Atlanta goes up after the Atlanta episodes every week. We're going to talk a little bit about Atlanta today. We've also got Recapables Billions going. So everything you need in the world, the ringer.com's got it. Except we're not putting out two albums in June like Kanye West is. Can we do it before we... I, we keep putting a couple befores before we get into that news. We should say that we're also doing book club today. Oh, we're doing book... I was going to get to the table of contents. We're doing book club. We're doing Atlanta. We've yeah. got a special guest joining us for book club. Yeah. Elwood Reed, showrunner extraordinaire, is here to talk about James Crumley and The Last Good Kiss with us. And then Monday we have a great show because we're talking about the first episode of Westworld. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to be joined. We were joined. We recorded it already, but it was one of our favorite pods we've done in a really long time. Bill Hader... The creator, director, star of Barry, along with Alec Berg and a bunch of other talented people working on that show, and his co-star, Henry Winkler. The legend. The ledge. I mean, this was a good one. We had a really good time with these guys. Gentlemen both. <laughs> yeah. Um, a very. I have to say, Henry Winkler really taught me, like, it's about what you put into the world. Henry Winkler is a positive and kind person. <laughs> yes. We sat at a small wooden table with him for, you know, 40 minutes, and I, I could have stayed there all day. We're really yeah. excited for you to hear this podcast. We also recommend that in preparation for Monday's podcast, you catch up fully on Barry. If you started yes. it and jumped off the train at some point, it's definitely time to jump back on. Episode four, which aired last week, and episode five, which airs this Sunday, are by far the best of the season yes. to date. Yeah. And uh, we talk heavily about the events of those episodes in this conversation. So we want you caught up. The God Hero Mirai directing Sundays. Really good one. Yeah. Get, get back on the Barry wagon. Okay. Let's get back on the Kanye wagon really yes. quick. I don't really know what to say other than, so Kanye's been tweeting for the last couple of days what he is calling his book. A philosophy book. It's just like a philosophy book. He's also just like dumping the notes from his mm. iPhone. To spe- like, here's a tattoo that some somebody designed for me. Here's a prototype for some, like a Caterpillar boot. Some that, boot work yeah, he's doing. I guess, you know. Light boot Just work. in time for summer. Um and Kanye obviously is somebody who looms large over our, our this podcast and over our collective imaginations mm-hmm. and is a very like seminal artist for both of us. We've essentially grown up with him. I mean, this is one of those artists who is uh he's making, our he's our age. Right. And is making records sort of about the time in his life exactly where we are in our lives. Um although I I would venture to say that we have sort of deviated from the electricity that he was feeling 
between Yeezus and Pablo. But we're going to see what middle life middle age Kanye is all about because he's got two records coming out in June. The first one is a seven song solo album Great that choice. I don't think has been named yet no. as of as of the recording. The other is a collaboration with Kid Cudi called Kid See Ghost. He also announced that there is a Push a T record coming out on May 25th, so good music is back in the building. I mean, I'll believe it when I see it, but we have been waiting for a Push a album for a number of years. Yeah. The rumors swirling from the minute the Push announced it that Kanye was going to produce the whole record. I mean, his his lips to the good music god's ears. I hope so, but hopefully we'll find out soon. So I would put Pablo for me mm-hmm. in the 808s bucket of Kanye records that I very infrequently revisit. Interesting. Um, So the last bit of Kanye that I got is not my favorite Kanye. Also, kind of a rocky couple of months for the guy, or like, you know, a year and a half for the guy, or however long it's been, Mm -hmm. uh, including what people took as like a sort of tacit, if not an endorsement, at least a normalizing of Trump by appearing uh, in a, a photo with him and obviously meeting with him. And uh, some some like questionable tweets about Bill Cosby. So like the last few public forward facing moments for Kanye were not good. Um, And, you know, lesser artists and and other artists and other people have been uh, called out, all called out much more than Kanye probably was for those moments, whereas we kind of like brush those aside as Kanye being Kanye. I, I push back on that only to say that he's he was unwell. And I don't mean he's unwell in the sense that I dismiss the mental competence of anyone who willingly appears next to Donald Trump. Sure. What I mean is the Pablo experience, and I, I rate that record a lot higher than you do, I think. I I love it. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I think it is in many ways his most revealing record because it is just pure id pouring out. I mean, he couldn't let go of it. He kept changing it and it kept mutating and it's a hundred different things at once. And it has some of his greatest music on it and some of his worst, sometimes in the same song, like the opening of uh, Father Stretch My Hands, yeah. which is maybe the most exciting beat drop of the last decade and the most appalling opening lyric of the century. So all in the same song. So it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot to process. It, it, it's, a, it's a lot to process, uh, and it was also just unvarnished. It was, and I don't in any way mean to make light of mental illness because he, I think he admitted or people armchair diagnosed, but his behavior seemed bipolar. Mm-hmm. And uh, he needed to go away to work on himself and not work on his tweets or his boots. I think that people in his life would feel that way. I think people who feel themselves to be part of his life like we do felt that way. Um, I will add, though, just purely as a fan, this was the first time I was ready to take a break. Yeah. Um, I've always wanted more Kanye music. I've always wanted more Kanye content. I'm just, I'm a fan and I'm fascinated but this time I was happy to take a break and I, I didn't listen to the records for a minute and I just tried not to think about it, honestly, because I, I want to. And, and and this is a whole other conversation that maybe we'll have another time or maybe we just always are having it, that to be a fan of people's extreme behavior, it, it when the bill comes due, it's sometimes hard to remain a fan of it. Absolutely. Um, and so I began to feel a little strange about my love of his envelope boundary pushing him. He's a dad. You know, he has he has other responsibilities beyond entertaining or shocking us. So all that is to say, this is fascinating. It has not been that much time, but it feels like a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, collaborating with people who appear to be important to him, um, both socially. <laughs> is that how you're describing Kid Cudi? <laughs> well, no, I, yes. But I also yeah. mean push it. Like people who seem yeah. to have been there for him and he seems to have a connection to I've only really liked Cuddy's music when he's collaborating with Kanye, so I have I'm optimistic about that. But seven tracks to come back to that are the right seven tracks. That's the right size album for this moment, I think. Um, I am very curious what Man of the Woods Kanye sounds like because this dude has gotten from everything we've seen. He's gotten blonder. He's gotten a little more swole in the uh, middle aged dad way, yeah. not in the working out at Equinox kind of way. And uh, he's been in Wyoming, so. I don't, I don't know, but I'm ready. Yeah, I'm going to separate this into two categories. One is that I think probably the reason why the conversation about Kanye is different than, say, the conversation about Taylor Swift is because Taylor Swift is somebody who seems to never have an unguarded moment, mm-hmm. whereas Kanye He's lives all. in all unguarded moments. Now, I am completely open to the idea that Kanye's quote-unquote unguarded moments are, in fact, a 
diversionary tactic and are in, the, in of themselves guarded. Sometimes, but I think the reason why some you know people might and I you know Charity's been tweeting a lot about this today, and it's really it's a fascinating debate. But the reason why we've kind of litigated Taylor Swift and assigned her this like you are the Valkyrie of of deplorable America assi- like uh, handle is because she omitted telling us how she really felt felt she 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 eschewed the whole responsibility of saying in this crucial time i'm going to put it on the table kanye actually i don't know necessarily told us much more than taylor swift did but because of who she showed who he showed up with and the moment that that was taken mm. taking place in it felt like one of a hundred other things that were just chaos in his life well, so that's why i, oh, I you mean I, by showing up with trump mm-hmm I don't think he said anything politically. I think he was operating. I, I think he deeply believes in the idea of life as performance and perform and life as art. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of what he was doing, or at least thinking he was doing during that era, was you know, and also what he's doing with his life. Frankly, finding what appears to be, you know, I don't want to judge or even presume knowledge, but apparently is romantic love with someone who is primarily a tabloid figure. Yeah, you know, to the, the larger world. Yeah is he was commenting, I think he thinks he was commenting on celebrity, but he got too close to the third rail of actual life, both his life and the country's wounded life in that moment. Yeah. Um, I don't think politics had anything to do with it. So there's all of that. And then there is the other thing, which is the undeniable feeling you get whenever a Kanye project feels imminent, which is actually, I can't think of another artist who is, I felt this way for this long about, which is what's it going to sound like? And it, it, and that yeah. that moment where you're just like, I, I can't wait to th- to hear what he's been listening to and to hear what he thinks is interesting now. And that's been sort of the the journey that we've been on with him since college dropout, since the mixtapes before college dropout. His his greatest ability might be as a yeah a pop artist, but as a collage artist. Yeah, I mean, he 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 does have fascinating, wide ranging, often impeccable. Um, future leaning taste and he combines them in ways that surprises everyone and defines what comes next and contrast that with, an, with the other major artist who's about to drop which is Drake mm. and yeah, um, Scorpion. Nice for What the single that came out two weeks ago is like a fucking silver bullet <laughs> designed in a, designed in some sort of super lab to slay every werewolf on the planet like it is so good and it is so brilliantly good and then the video is so it, it, there's a certain point in the video, you know, when when Misty Copeland, the ballerina, is flexing, and I'm like, everything about this is so calculated, but I am in awe of its calculation. Yeah. Everything about this was so brilliantly considered and designed and released on us, and it's a number one single, and it should be. Um, Kanye doesn't do that. Yeah, Kanye is not uh, focused. It's not that it's focus testing. Kanye is not really thinking about what we as a country are going to do in reaction to these seven songs, (laughs) other than the fact that he knows we're going to do something. Yes. And that is always going to be more interesting, even if the music isn't as brutally effective. Uh, We were going to talk more about Atlanta today, Andy, but I I figured we should at least do a couple of minutes on it um, and and we can get deeper into it maybe next Thursday. But um, we're almost towards the end of this season. I think there are only three episodes left. And I think that the, the sort of, even not knowing exactly how many episodes are left is a testament to the kind of ethereal nature of Dislocation. this. Yeah, I feel like this has been a very unique experience with a television show this season where I'm watching it week to week. It is one of the highlights of my culture weeks every week. But at the same time, um, feels like a step removed from the centrality that it had the first season. It's not a critique. It's just a commentary on maybe the ever-changing way in which we talk about and process television. Um I think Helen is still my favorite episode of the season. Was that? We yeah. didn't even talk about it for you to say that. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was just, it felt different than any other Atlanta episode in that way that great Atlanta episodes always feel different than every mm-hmm. other Atlanta episode. Uh, do you have a favorite this year? Is there anything that's been jumping out at you? Um, it's a great question. First, I want to I want to push back a little bit on your point, which I think is is right, but I would phrase it a different way. I think Atlanta is totally unique, not only because it is, as we said at the beginning of the season, essentially one of the last consensus shows. It has the belt. It's the best thing on TV by a large margin. And we're not alone in thinking that. What's fascinating to me about this season is the show is wildly digressive and disorienting and artistic and and um, uh, idiosyncratic. Mm-hmm. 
it is also still quite mainstream popular in as far as these things go these days. Sure. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's not getting Roseanne numbers. I don't even no, mean I wasn't spark really debate. talking but, about but, but, the, the numbers. No, but I think, as, yeah. I think what you mean is that it, it, it's not carrying us through narrative in the way traditional belt shows have. But what's amazing to me about it is that it is somehow still maintaining its quasi centrality to everyone's opinions or mm-hmm. everyone's it, it, most people agree i think that this is the best show on tv from a large swath of the tv viewing public but it's doing so with willful strangeness and de- de- seemingly t- seeming to delight in leading us astray and i find that really encouraging i mean as someone who likes challenging things but also really fascinating it, if i have a criticism about this season it's that i wish they made more uh, episodes Maybe that would make them less special. Maybe that's not acknowledging how difficult it is to make these. Yeah. But this, the driving engine of the show does seem to be, this is what Donald Glover and Stephen Glover and their incredibly talented team of writers are passionate about. Mm-hmm. This is where their muse is taking them week to week. And we're getting these small slivers of life um, that f- when you're up close don't necessarily seem to even link up with each other. But when watched together, create something larger. Um, they have such talent and they have such just such natural resources in this incredible cast and this and Hero Mirai's uh, directorial vision like and Amy Simons yeah. and Amy Simons who's directed the other episodes I, I I feel like I just feel hungry for more which doesn't seem fair we we should mention I think a lot of people wanted us to weigh in on um, the Teddy Perkins episode mm-hmm. which was jaw dropping in every possible way I, th- I think we recorded that day and we had been told that that would that episode would be presented without commercials. And I think that we assumed that it would have some social element that was relevant, that felt relevant to the moment, whether it was about Black Lives Matter or policing or something political. I don't know why we assume that because I, that's the 2018. It just, it's, the, there was a press release from FX that made it sound like it was a very special episode we, of Atlanta. I don't the, think we anticipated it being that. Yeah, It's the 2018 version of a very special episode. Yeah. It's not about Jason Bateman losing his virginity on Valerie's family or right. whatever, but Hogan family. But uh, but this is where we are. Um it, that, that was an episode that you could watch in the moment and thrill to. Yeah. Um, and think about for now two weeks and still not be settled with it, which is one of the more amazing things you can say about a we, you know, a random episode of a serialized TV show. It, it, what it had to say about celebrity, identity, about blackness, about talent, about um, responsibilities to any of these things, I, I have not sorted out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually, people were saying, how can you not how can you guys not podcast about it right away? And actually, I feel like it's a testament to the magnitude of that, of that episode that I was relieved we weren't podcasting right, after it. Right. It felt too rich to parse, um, including all this, the incredible meta reactions one could I'm have I'm still to it, not over the, the owl's casket or whatever that thing was called. The what? <laughs> the owl casket, the, the ostrich egg that he has to oh, eat. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. The, the, the I'm, I'm still, like, still processing that. How about the fact that it's um, it's Keith Stanfield once again trapped in <laughs> some nightmarish home I know. With a, where a flash disorients him, you know? I mean, the, the, knowing when they made this, I think they wrote this season before... Donald went to film Donald like we're pals before he went to film uh, Han Solo. So the get out get out may have happened in between. I don't know. Um, what other show can flex like that and then have last week's episode um, Champagne Poppy, which is just on the surface, a very straightforward episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Van goes out. That's that's basically what it is. But. Even within it, it's possible to just luxuriate in the attention to details and specificity of moment and person and, and, and character that the show does. That Van, who in other episodes is presented to us as um, the saint. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's she's the mother. She's the girlfriend. She's the steady things. And Ern is choosing, you know, a more uh, fluid, let's say, life instead of her. In this one. She's she's just up in them Instagram filters. She is not a saint, you know. She steals Drake's jacket, um, which, to be fair, it's a very nice jacket. I I love that the show, in seeming to do very little or to take take not take a week off but relax into something, sure. can still be Titanic. Mm-hmm. And I do think no one is calling this Atlanta Robin season. Sorry, FX marketing department. But I get why they flagged that for us because this idea of what is being stolen week to week whether it's something literal or whether it's dignity 
and another week is really um, compelling. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we are going to get into the book club with Elwood Reed talking about James Crumley's Last Good Kiss. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by the big homies at Thomas's English Muffins. Yes. Again and again. It's always breakfast somewhere. Greenwald, are you looking for breakfast that's worth skipping the snooze button for? Mm-hmm. I know how you stays getting up at 4 a.m. Mm. And what do you want when you first greet the dawn? More sleep. More oh, nooks and crannies. That's better. Thomas's is the only English muffin brand, the only breakfast brand, that delivers a -a one-of-a-kind eating experience with its original Nooks and Crannies English muffins. There is nothing quite like that Nooks and Crannies texture, Mm. perfectly toasted, to Mm. give you irresistibly crispy edges with a soft, warm center. Undefeated breakfast food. Undefeated. Tell me who doesn't like Thomas's English muffins. The Nooks and the Crannies are unlike anything else because you can get the butter in the nooks and crannies. That's the idea. And you got the crispy, the soft, the butter. I go I go cuckoo for these. You lightly toast each half. You top them right away with butter. By the way, don't use a knife. Mm-mm. I mean, you can basically just twist them apart, but use a fork. Don't don't cut. That's a rookie move. And you just watch how the butter melts and pools inside all those amazing little nooks and crannies spaces. It's a delicious burst of flavor in every warm, toasty, t- buttery bite. And if you haven't had them already, you have to toast and butter some Thomas's Nooks and Crannies English muffins because they're truly like no other. Today's episode is brought to you by Google Assistant. With the Google Assistant, you can complete over a million actions on your phone, in your car, and around the house. For example, hey Google, add chips and salsa to my shopping list. Okay, I've added chips and salsa to your shopping list. Download the Google Assistant today. Chris, do you hear that music that we don't have? <laughs> it's the book club music. This is one of our favorite parts of the podcast. And today, especially this edition of the, of the Double Down Book Club, we are thrilled because we're talking about one of our favorite books, one of our formative books, and one of our favorite authors. The book is The Last Good Kiss. The author is James Crumley. And our guest is Elwood Reed, who loves this book and this lifestyle as much as we do. <laughs> uh, I've seen how that lifestyle ends with Jim Crumley. It's uh, <laughs> not. Uh, yeah. It yeah. ends about as happily as this book ends. Uh, yeah. Elwood, we should reintroduce you. You were a guest on this podcast a couple years ago when you were show running one of my favorite shows. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The Bridge yeah, on yeah. FX. Um, you recently show ran The Shy mm-hmm. for Showtime. Congratulations mm-hmm. on a successful first season. And um, But you are also, you're a book guy. You're a crime yes. fiction guy. Yeah, I yeah. am. And you're an American guy because you've yeah. been to these towns. You've done these drives. I, I still I have a house in Montana. I live. I, I have a great affinity for this, this the West that he writes about, which still exists, by the way, when you go into weird pockets of the West. Well, I think that's a good place to start as any. And we will get in a little bit into the plot of this book and what makes this book particularly special. But can I think we should open up the conversation by, by talking about the world and the world that Crumley came from and created. Because I think for both Chris and myself, when we picked up this book, we had not done – all night dexedrine fuel drives from Salt Lake City <laughs> Missoula, to Missoula. To, yeah. I, I mean, now we have, sure. Yeah, sure. But at the time we had, and this book written in 78, I think, yeah. it creates, it, it doesn't feel like it exists. And it's almost shocking and jarring to realize that this effort did exist. And to, to, to dive into it the way you do in this book is was literally intoxicating in multiple levels. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so let's start there. So what, how, how do you introduce this world. I mean, you used to teach English. Let's well, I mean, I, I, it's funny because you brought up so many things like you, f- I forgot about the travel in the book. Yes. It, which is something, I mean, I, I drive, this is something about myself. I drive from Los Angeles to Livingston, Montana, which is the fastest I've done it is 14 hours. <laughs> the average time, depending on how many kids I take and vomiting pets, <laughs> uh, is about 20 hours and depending on weather, but I do it probably four or five times a year and I do not stop. Sometimes there are things that help me drive that fast. And, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, How many but, road uh, beers? I, I can't do that. Yeah, I'm, road, I'm that an up would, guy. Yeah, that would be know. in the opposite yeah, yeah, direction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like listen to black metal really loud and like, you know, <laughs> grind my jaw and drive. So yeah. when you physically connect the distance between these totally disconnected places, what does that do? It, you know, it's funny because the other thing I, about this book that I was thinking about is because, you know, he travels very quickly in some of these places in the book. And he and he and he's very good at landscape, Crumley is, in the book, I think. Mm-hmm. He doesn't get enough credit for that. But um, those this towns that he talks about, there are pockets in Idaho and in particular in Montana where the mini mauling of America has not entered yet. There's still the little weird diners and the off-name bars and stuff like that. And it's funny. Every time I go by, I kind of 
that, I, that romance of the crumbly sort of like creeps in when I'm driving. I was like, oh, I'm going to stop off at the – I have. I go to pawn shops sometimes and, mm-hmm. you know, but like there's those towns that have not changed I think since crumbly was bopping around there. And it is – the West is a bar culture. Um, it, it really is because some of these towns have way more bars than they have, you know, you know, hospitals or restaurants or anything like that. It's, it's crazy what they have in some of these towns because there's nothing to do in the winter. And I think that's the place to sort of like whenever I drive through those places, I'm reminded of – one of the things that drew, you know, drew me out west, which was reading James Crumley, reading Jim Harrison, you know, also the poetry of Richard Hugo, who he talks about a lot as a big influence in him. Um, uh, those those things I'm reminded of a lot when I drive out there. And Hugo's the guy who introduced James Crumley to Raymond Chandler and yeah. sort of set him along this path. And you're, you mentioned Crumley's good at landscapes. Yeah. And when I read this book, which came after reading a lot of the books that I think were influenced like by this, like Pelicanos, the thing you really pick up on is how different he is almost contemporaneously to guys like Elmore Leonard, mm-hmm. to guys like Ed McBain, to guys like Ross Thomas, Ross Thomas to guys like Carl Hyacin, yeah. or whoever you think is popular around that late 70s, early 80s, mm-hmm. mid 80s time. It's just, this is a completely different kind of crime yeah. fiction that I was ever used to. This is more like a lyrical kind of Thomas McGuane novel yeah. that also yeah, yeah. happens to have kidnapping in the porn industry and mobsters and everything and, else. And, and this one is, compared and compared to his later books, which I also wholeheartedly recommend, this one is actually kind of tight. Yeah. Even though upon mm-hmm. rereading it, I'm like, it's, it's still pretty <laughs> far-fetched. But this one, it, this is, a, you, you people listening to this podcast who have read the book won't believe it when I say this, but this is one of his more sober books <laughs> yeah, in all, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in yeah. all senses. But um, even so, it is so deeply, and I think you feel this from the first page, it's really not about the specifics. It's not about the TikTok. It's about the journey. It kind of turns into a Hitchcock movie in the last thir- the, like the last act, and yeah. it has those kinds of twists. But before that, it doesn't feel like Well, that. I never read for plot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, I was yeah. reminded of that yeah. when I read this. I was like, because I had completely forgotten the plot. But I remembered all the fucking crazy weird scenes. Me too, yeah. The ashtray scene. I mean, I remember all that stuff. You know what I mean? And, and it's um, – you brought up some of his contemporaries. And I always think of this guy – Crumley is there's a sort of these sort of writers, Edward James, either Edward Lee or Edward James Hurley, who wrote Midnight Cowboy, mm-hmm. um, Newton Thornburg, who wrote To Die in yeah, yeah, California, yeah, yeah. which is a super underrated and, book, and, and, and Cutter's and, and, Cutter and Cut, Bone. And Dreamland, one of my favorites. I've not read Dreamland. Ooh. And Daryl Ponixan, who yeah. did like The Last, Last Detail. Detail yeah. There's all these sort of like, they, I think, were the more what, 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 and they were, and they're completely fucking forgotten. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because um, there's a sort of, I don't know, I was very take when I read this book again how much tarnish he puts on every single thing. Mm-hmm. Even when he describes something beautiful that he loves, there's always that sort of gloom or that like the clouds or the pollution or the, you know, it's just, it's it's sort of a very cynical way of looking at the world without it being, you know, it, it, almost in the way sort of that Elroy would do. It very it, it, The cynicism doesn't come through in, as, as a pose. It's yeah. just, it's a worldview. Yeah, Elroy is constantly something. like, I'm, I'm showing you my hand. Yeah, it feels like yeah. it's right here in the right. shoulder all yeah, the time. Yeah. yeah, I don't get that sense well, of crumbling. One of the great pleasures, and I think this is, you know, an, an umbrella statement for the project of this book club, one of the great pleasures of reading crime fiction or whatever genre we decide this falls into is watching people comment on the degradation of the American dream or the post-war mm-hmm. dream in mm-hmm. real time. Um, another writer I love, John D. McDonald, who wrote the, um, the Travis McGee books, the Travis McGee books span three decades with one character, and if you read them all the way through, which I pre kids <laughs> did, um, his he even he gets cynical. He sees Florida die all around him, and the violence becomes too much for him, and and the stakes and the drugs. It's yeah. just much more than the world he he was born into. We we talk about that with Crumley, but we should also contextualize the author himself, who came out of um, came out of the war and had hopes and dreams of being a respected novelist or a great American novelist. And he wrote, um, his first book was this war book called One to Count Cadence, Mm -hmm. which I will cop to on this podcast is I've never been able to finish. I have it on my shelf. It just didn't grab me. He basically fell backwards into crime fiction because he wasn't selling, right? He wasn't publishing and he found a way in. And we always, I think Chris and I, it, it doubled our passion for this stuff when we realized that these secretly were the great American novels in many ways yeah. of the era. As, as there was this bifurcation of the literary scene from paperbacks to the MFA program, you know, with nothing in the middle, this stuff was actually talking about things. But his own disappointment with his career and where he <laughs> yeah. ended up is yeah. runs through every page, yeah, and it's yeah. impossible to separate that. And there's a bridge book in there, too, I was thinking about, too, and you're talking about this. It. Like, it's. I love Robert Stone, but Dog Soldiers is yeah, another sure. one that's very much in that vein. And it's sort of like there was something 
you know, I, I've met him a few times, and he's a very interesting guy. This is I, one um, of the reasons you're here is to tell but, us these stories. You know, you, I don't want to say I felt like a, a rela- you know, a kindred spirit, but like there's this thing you have when you're not to the manner born of book the book world. Um, and I feel feel very much like him when I was started out as a writer. I didn't know anything about writers. I had, you know, I'd read feverishly, but I had no dr- intentions, and I didn't, you know, we, it was not part of my culture really. Um, it was interesting. He felt the same way, and he was embarrassed by all the knowledge that he had. And he was very well read, and he, I find that case to be with a lot of writers. Like, he, you know, one time I brought Elmer Leonard in. I was in an MFA program, and he knew more about literature and and narrative tropes, mm-hmm. going all the way back than than any of the academics there did. He didn't just he didn't vomit it out. It was there just at this sort of baseline of. And I, Crumley was the same way. Deeply well read guy, um, very shy and and sort of quiet in person. Um, he was a guy who, you know, I, we were over in France together, and it did not matter. Written these these sort of literary festivals, they call him Big Jim, Big Jim. They'd follow him around, and <laughs> he was parked at the bar in this little tiny place in Saint Malo. It didn't matter what time he went down there, and he was parked at the bar in this sort of black sweatpants with cigarette ash all over his belly, <laughs> and he could not really move. Yeah, like his big move was to get up from the bar to go to his room to go to the bathroom. Or where they would cart him to sort of one of the literary book signing events. He's more like Fireball Roberts in the book. <laughs> and that was another thing I had thought about when I yeah. read the book. I was like, he became that bulldog in the yeah. book, um, limping around. And it was like, but he was very quiet and soft spoken, and he loved to engage. He didn't really give a shit about fans, so to speak. Um, and he and he seemed almost ashamed of the books he'd written. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mm-hmm. I mean that like, and I did them, yes, but let's talk about something else. And it would anything. Like yeah. We talked about a fucking you know. Why were we in a bar eating uh, tooth- olives off of toothpicks? Because all the French, you know, they eat the olives off of toothpicks in this one place. And it really bothered him that they did that. <laughs> and, um, he would, he, they didn't have peanuts from at the bar, you know. And so it was like uh, it, he was just a very interesting guy, very soft-spoken. And it's always hard when you meet your idols like that. You, you know, I'm sure you guys have had that sure. opportunity many times. But he surpassed it because he didn't – he wasn't pretending to be anything. There was no pose. There was no act. And, and he was very sweet and well-read. And, and he, you know, we just talked about books. And we talked about Richard Hugo a lot. Because Richard Hugo had wrote a book that I love called uh, Death and the Good Life, which is sort of this sort of sloppy mystery. But it's, it's really fun. And he loved that book. He couldn't figure out why people no one read that book. And it really bothered him that no one had read that book. So in the context that you're laying out for us, and I think uh, there may be people listening who picked up the book and had a similar experience, mm-hmm. what did this book, the first time you read it, well, when did you read it for the first time? And what did it snap into focus for you on your journey to being a writer I just think it's always about voice because I was. I mean, it's the same thing. I, it's the same thing with television. It's voice and character and tone, and 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 those those three things are very very evident in all of his books from the very opening paragraph. And I, it's really hard to read the opening paragraph of this book or even the wrong you know the wrong case or Dancing Bear and not want to know more about the person telling you the story. Yeah. And he had talked to me one time. This is a weird conversation. This is a writerly conversation, but he'd been very bothered by third person. He'd tried books in third person and failed at them. Um, and that's something you go through when you're trying to write novels a lot is that third first person decision. And and I think for him, it had to be right there. He, it had to be him on the page. And you did get that sense when you talked to him. Like there was a, you know, a part of him in all these books and, and, and that guy was there. Yeah. I know? mean, one thing that's interesting to read his catalog going forward, he, he never wrote a book or published a book that wasn't a crime mm-hmm. book after this. Um, they alternate between his two detectives, um, between – Sugaru, who you meet in this book, and Sugaru refers to his ex-partner, and that partner is Milo, who is the star of Dancing Bear in The Wrong Case and Final Country, and there's Border Snakes, which is mm. switches between the two, sure. and that's a, yeah, that's yeah. a personal favorite. Yeah. Um, but one thing I was realizing when reading this is there's no difference between these two guys, really. I mean, later on, after Sugaru has some stuff happen to him, the Mexican the, the, tree duck, we don't, can yeah. tell, he, he, suddenly Milo is a little bit bigger and older, and Sugaru's a little more wiry and nastier, <laughs> but the description of Sugaru in this book is... I, it seems it seems it's all crumbling. Well, we don't often talk about the like commercial concerns of these books. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, no, it's, well, because it, it's actually kind of yeah. part of the fun of them, right? It's like we talk a lot about with Ross Thomas. He starts out with the Fools in Town are on our side, or it's like well, I don't know where in the chronology of his. It books was in that, the middle, but it was when he it was a pinnacle of his. It ambition. was his big swing, though, right? Yeah, and then yeah. it's like he realizes that what he really needs to do is write these two hundred and seven page novels that come out every eighteen months, and that's what's going to pay the rent in his bar bill. And that probably is the case for Crumley too. I mean, Final Country. Is pretty sweeping and is a pretty like epic look at the West, you know. But is obviously more of the outlier than something like this, which I bet is is like it's kind of like a jab to the chin, you know, like this one. Yeah, and then and then the very last one, the Right Madness, um, 
is I ha- is the only one I haven't reread because that was the one. It's, it was interesting to hear you say it, Owen, that he. I felt like there was some shame in that book almost. There was like, okay, yeah. I'm putting on the suit again. Yeah, like he needs Tommy John yeah. surgery. <laughs> there, there's there's some violence in the beginning of that book that is so over the top and horrific, and you almost feel him showing you that he can still do this. Yeah, yeah. This is what you want from me. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's always fascinating in any medium. It happens in music too. I'm sure it happens in every art form. People who feel resentful or trapped by the thing they are most celebrated yeah. for. Um, but, you know, it, it's possible to read these books in particular at different stages in your life and find different things in them. I think when Chris and I were reading them and maybe you as well when you read Hit Crumley for the first time, we were younger and we were definitely getting high on books that got high. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the when to, to realize that there's like not just a fifth gear, but there's like an 11th gear of drunkenness yeah. possible. <laughs> and then you get in the car and drive. Yeah. I don't recommend anyone does that. But to have that kind of adventure on the page um, is thrilling. This then, is a theme with you, this day drinking. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I wish I was drunk right now. I'm going to be honest with you, just to get through yeah. it. But then you read it now and it's uh, it's it's – there's sadness in it that you don't notice when you're younger. Yeah, it's funny because I think, I don't know about you guys, like I, when I read this, it, it was the perfect marriage for me. When you're trying to be a writer and you're trying to read the great books, so to speak, and I don't want to, you know, I think all all books are, are of some use, is I felt like this was the first book that sort of straddled the line. I go, there's really good fucking writing in this book. Mm-hmm. And things happen. And this character isn't, sitting there staring at their, you know, belly button. Um, it's not the, you know, sort of right. the Henry James uh, approach, you know, like kind of this room. Life it's even, of the mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's like, but, and, you know, Elmer Leonard's the same way. And and, and you're, I think when you're younger and you're looking for this, you're looking for this, like, is it okay for me to like yes. this stuff? And and I never, ever question it from the beginning sentence when you read this book. There's no fucking question. You you love it. You're in. You're in for the ride. You're in for the voice. And I think that's because of that voice and because of those descriptions we're talking about. Yeah. And I. It's funny you talk about the differences between the two characters. I went back and looked because I had this sort of working theory about the two. Milo's a little bit more able to see nicer things out his window. Sure. CW is not like it's very dark. Like this is a troubled, troubled guy. He, yeah, he's know? nastier, and he has, yeah. he has the war. The different. I mean, they're from different wars. Is, oh yeah, is, is how it emerges. And, yeah, and, I, I never thought of that, but and, yeah, and, and yeah. it's echoed in the relationship with Traheran too. Yeah, and, and and worth noting, um, for everything we're saying about Crumley's own chip on his shoulder, he's written this book where a, where a, a nasty, messed up alcoholic guy. Also got a master's in literature, by the way, <laughs> and he ultimately has the moral high ground over this literary giant right? Yeah. who is nothing but uh, a child, who's yeah. nothing but a pampered baby and a hypocrite and a total mess. Um, and yet to read these books, th- this happens more again in the later books. As I, I think I've said before in this podcast, I've read The Final Country three or four times. I have no fucking idea what happens in that <laughs> book or what it's about, but God, I love it. It's yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, in this one, you feel him almost change his mind constantly. Yeah, there's it, a, it's not like he was seat of his pants because he had all these papers and drafts and their versions of some of these books yeah. that ended up in other places. But like, even as Sugar changes his mind on Traheran and we learn more about him in this book, some of these turns are on a dime. Where oh, it's yeah. like, he loves him. He's wonderful. Oh, no, he's actually complicit. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It's all over the place. I think that uh, do you, I was wondering whether or not you found as somebody who works obviously in, in, in as a work to pet in the past in movies and now in television more like if you saw him drawing from any cinematic influences because I think that I, I know that he had like a sort of tangential relationship doing some Hollywood stuff doing some script writing I'm always really fascinated by guys from that era I was reading um, some John Gregory Dunn stuff a little yeah, while yeah. ago and it's just like the lifestyle of like kind of like picking up a $2,000 check here and there seemed to go <laughs> a hell of a long way. Like I know that there's a lot of family money in d- different places, but like the idea that these guys could do like one polish on a Western oh, yeah. and then just be like, and I lived for 18 yeah. months on that. Well, in Montana. Maybe. Yeah, right. But did you see, do you see him drawing from any, whether it's Chinatown or things from that, you know, there's echoes of mm. hardcore in it. Uh, of, of I never thought of that, but yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny because I think, Maybe I just assumed, maybe perhaps incorrectly, is he came from that generation of writers that viewed Hollywood work as somehow sort of beneath. Oh, no, I don't sure. say beneath yeah. them, but yeah. like, why do I have to do this to write my books? And the truth is, a lot of those guys had to do that. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd be this writer I love more than anything else. Barry Hanna had like oh, one, yeah. one you know, screenwriting job, and he talks about it all the time. But he just he felt so ashamed that he was out there doing it. 
um, and why he was doing it to go back and write books that people weren't reading. Yeah, because he thinks he's supposed to be in Oxford, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. but they yeah. All, but they all chased it for one degree or another, whether because they loved movies or yeah. because they appreciated the paycheck, or you know, like all of us, they had egos. And you know, obviously, I've been thinking a lot about Ross Thomas, and he lived in Malibu for the last mm-hmm. half of his life and had a real relationship with cinema. And he wanted to work in it. Interesting. And his credits, um, if you were only to know him by his IMDb page, he wrote a movie which was an adaptation of a crime book called Hammett by Joe Gores, yeah. that's basically imagining Hammett as a detective. Um, and he wrote an, co-wrote an episode of Tales from Didn't the Crypt. Didn't Vim Vendors direct that? And, uh, who directed that? Yeah, Vim Vendors directed yeah. it. And he, wrote, he co-wrote an episode of Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> and, uh, and he also wrote a movie called Bad Company that I think came out just before he died or, or just after, which Lawrence Fishburne and Ellen Barkin. Yeah. And it's fine. You know, and meanwhile, turn around, there's 25 sparkling books, yeah. but it's a very different ledger. Um, but I, I, but when do you say it's? Cine- I mean, I think your question, Chris, is: is it, there's a, there's a cinematic quality to the writing? It feels like an extension of m- mm-hmm. my romantic idea of new American cinema of the late seventies. Yeah, of, guys, of, you know, in yeah, the dark Altman, with, a, with their hand yeah. on a wheel and a cigarette burning. Yeah, and like, you of know. Robert Town and Robert yeah. Altman, some of those directors and screenwriters, even Hal Ashby. Yeah. some of the some of the ways in which he views, you know, and and there there are the thematically, I think there you could call this book out of the past. You could call this book Lost in America. You could call this book like a lot yeah. of things that it feels like a picture of an of America right before that Reagan page turns and right before I think we get industrialized in a, in a very technologically savvy way. Mm-hmm. And the idea that somebody like Betty can kind of disappear into an, an another life is, is, is hard to fathom now. I mean, I'm sure yeah. there are viral stories out there, stuff like that, but it's hard to imagine. And yet it still feels incredibly relevant. Everything, every place that he visits feels impossibly close and impossibly far away. He can get there overnight yeah. by mm-hmm. driving, yet um, Rosie lives in Sonoma and has never set foot out of Sonoma to look for her daughter for 10 years. San Francisco yeah. is, a, is a continent away, culturally, social, in, in all aspects. Um, since you have the personal firsthand experience, Elwood, can you tell, tell us about Montana in the way, because it does sound like you have found things there that would have also drew Crumley there. Crumley wrote mostly about Montana and Texas and all the land in between and the connections yeah. between them. Um, I think people who are essentially flyover coastal people lump Montana and some of these Middle West or North, I don't even know what you would call Montana, lump it in with the other states that they don't think about and not thinking about it. But Montana has a richer cultural footprint than people might realize. I mean, it's interesting because there's 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 a there's a fair amount of Hollywood in po- pockets of Montana. But like one thing like, that like drew Bozeman, me there, like, this, like well, I mean, I live or, uh, living on the other side of the hill. I have a house. What drew me out there was I went to do an article out there on grizzly bears. It's tracking grizzly bears and mountain lions or something like that. And uh, when I – in the town, I had some friends who were writers. You know, I knew Jim Harrison spent time there mm-hmm. and I had known him and we had spent time together. And a, f- a friend of mine, Walter Kern, who's, you know, one of the smartest people yeah. I've ever met in my life, um, was there. And, and just, you know, in like 10 minutes in a bar where McGuane and Harrison and Crumley had all sat, you know, sitting there talking to Walter um, about – having the most elevated conversation about books that I had anywhere, anywhere, and includes, you know, I'm not very well educated, but even in college, um, was that it, I was like, holy shit, I'm in this town of fucking 5,000 people, and I'm having a conversation that, that I have never had. And, I, and, and then I would go fly fishing or go mushroom hunting or, you know, go get drunk in the bar at night. And it, it was, it's just this weird juxtaposition. It, it really, really appealed to me because it felt like I could draw on both of those worlds. Mm-hmm. And you'd sit down next to a guy who— you know, who worked for the railroad, but was also a reader. There's that sort of working class reading mentality. It's probably fading and almost gone now, but it still existed out there when I first moved out there and for sure was out there when Crumley was out there. Because in Missoula, because the writing program kind of bled through that whole area. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a lot of writers that sort of, you know, bled out into Montana and stayed there because of the lifestyle. Yeah. But that ability to go in and have a conversation about books. I mean, I, mean, I just want to stop against it. It's awesome that you guys do podcasts <laughs> about books. Don't stop. I mean, it's just I just feel like no one – I don't know. I get real sort of emotional when I think about books yeah, because of, of how much they mean to me. And like – and we're out in this, you know, in Hollywood here and be able to have a conversation about uh, – a crime novel that makes no sense that probably not many people have read is just an awesome it's thing. It's still such a singular experience to read yeah. something like this when you when you like when it really hits, it hits like unlike any other any other thing. And not to think about it as IP to be mined. Sure. I mean no, we, I we, know. with the asterisks that <laughs> we're someone out <laughs> there. Exactly. Well, you know, we always text each other yeah, like this yeah. is our this is, I mean I remember when you came out here, it was like, can we redo this? And I I've yeah. brought this book, these books up to so many people at studios and they kind of just look at you. 
Because I think it requires reading it. You can't read the back cover. Yes. It's not, there's no elevator pitch no, for it. Yeah, there's nothing. Vibe, which I also yeah. think dooms it in a good way, maybe from never being adapted, because it's it's so internal and it's so experiential. Yeah. yeah. It, there, there are books that you can, even really good, vibey books that you can strip the plot from. Yeah. And just use the plot and then trans, well, transplant it. Not but, to play... Not to argue for the IP, but something you said, Chris, really sort of, you know, sort of jogged something when I read the book again is what I think is even more resonant now than when I read it the first time is that historical snapshot of sort of the hippie hangover yep. in America in the yeah. West, which remember the West is – that area in the West is 10 years behind the rest of the country. Sure. And so when he's writing about the 70s, he's really sort of writing about that sort of just coming out of the 60s. Um, but it's still there and it's almost sort of – I don't, it was almost like it, it, it was even stronger now. It didn't feel dated at really, all. Really, yeah. For yeah. me, it just yeah. is a snapshot. And they've, I think Quarry, which is a TV show that I loved, I loved that no one fucking watched or talked about. That that that's what Quarry was. Yeah. Some, the DNA of Crumley is in Quarry I somehow. Completely I agree don't with know. you. Um, before we wrap up, Elwood, since we have you here, we're gonna obviously gonna suggest another book for the Double Down Book Club I think we got soon. It. Um, oh yeah, we, sh- we, sh- we yeah, should. it's Every Man a Menace by Patrick Hoffman. Chris is up on this. Yeah. I'm excited. It's incredible. It's basically, it's Jesus' son meets the global ecstasy trade. I'm in. Yeah. (laughs) So Elwood's going to read along. I hope everyone joins us. As a side note, Elwood, if you were designing, if you were still teaching, if you were designing the the syllabus for this course, your students have read The Last Good Kiss. Do you want to plug a a book that makes a logical next next step? Obviously, we would recommend more Crumley, but is there another Mm -hmm. writer to... You've mentioned some. Feel free to repeat them. Just to well, I mean, I'll people. stay in the noir genre. I think To Die in California is a really underrated lost book. And I agree it, with that. I, it has potential for other things, too. But, like, it's – I really love Newton Thornburg. I think he's a guy that just – it just got yeah, we got to hit him. Me, me too. Times, in in his know. book, Dreamland, also, he writes about I that have same, to read that. I've not read it's that. It's faded, crumbling, post-hippie, Ugh. just – yeah, it's dark. We're the post hippie podcast. That's what we are. <laughs> post hippie. <laughs> uh, Elwood, thank you so much for giving thank us your you. time, man. Thank you. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by Thomas's English Muffins. Here is a breakfast I always get out of bed for. Thomas's Original Nooks and Crannies English Muffins. There's nothing quite like that irresistible Nooks and Crannies texture. Perfectly toasted, crispy edges with a soft, warm center. How the butter pools inside all those nooks and crannies spaces is just amazing. It's a delicious burst of flavor in every warm, toasty, buttery bite. Thomas's Nooks and Crannies English Muffins are truly like no other. 